everyone. How many of you went out and did the rock the boat, the rock the boat, baby? I had an evil twin brother there. Somebody thought it was me out there dancing. So I have a boring tie for you today. The only thing cool about this tie is it matches the outfit. I can't say that for some of the others. And Brooke said that uh, this, this tie looks good and quit talking about ties. Oh, well. We, uh, we're going to talk today about Mars. And uh, I actually think that Mars will be the next place that humans explore. Uh, we may go back to the moon to learn how to live off the moon and to convert lunar dust into important things like bricks and oxygen and use solar furnaces to break apart their elements and use them for... So we've got to figure out how to live off the land, likely on the moon, and figure out uh, the technologies for habitats, for uh, atmospheric, uh, you know, whatever we can use off the land. It'll be easier on Mars because we know that Mars has water, and I will cover what, uh, some of the recent findings on Mars, and let's, uh, so let's just go ahead and launch off and see what we can do here. Mars, of course, is the next planet out from Earth, the fourth planet in our solar system, and the last of the four terrestrial rocky planets. The other planets, except for Pluto and the, and, the, and the ones that we have found outside Pluto, are gas giants. That would be Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. So Mars is the last one. It's smaller than Earth. It takes one point approximately nine years, or almost two of our Earth years, to orbit the Sun. And Mars's orbit is less circular than the most than the other eight planets, uh, Pluto's orbit is also quite a bit less circular, and it's inclined uh, to the Earth's uh, to the Sun's equator. Mars also has a tilt of about 25 degrees, where Mars, just like Earth, has seasons, but its seasons last roughly twice as long as our seasons. Instead of three months of spring, three months of of uh, summer and fall and winter, etc., those, uh, those seasons will be about six months long. Mars is red, basically. It's called the red planet. It's because it has a lot of oxidized iron or iron oxide. That's a fancy chemistry word for rust. That basically means rust. So the iron that's in the rocks and the surface material has been oxidized, turned red. It has a very thin layer of frozen carbon dioxide at both of the poles. We also know that there's frozen ice at both of the poles, but as there is on the Earth. The other interesting thing about Mars is its atmospheric pressure is very, very low. It is 100 times less dense than on Earth. So if I may use this equivalent, it is about the same pressure on Earth at 100,000 feet is the surface pressure on Mars. So very, very low pressure. We as humans would have to wear a lightweight spacesuit, not as heavy as the spacesuit that we use to go outside and do spacewalks on space station, but still we would have to have five to six pounds per square inch uh, to keep the human body uh, properly con uh, alive uh, on, on the surface of Mars. And of course, Mars's atmosphere is 95% carbon dioxide. It has very little oxygen and very little nitrogen. If you recall, our Earth's atmosphere is about 80% nitrogen and around 20% uh, oxygen, so Mars's atmosphere is quite different than ours. And for this reason, because of the low pressure, liquid water does not exist for any significant period of time on the surface of Mars. 
Well, I will show you some pictures where we have clear evidence that liquid water used to exist on Mars and made canyons and made rivers and made tributaries. So that means that sometimes in par Mars's past history, early in its formation, it had to have a much higher atmospheric pressure for the liquid water to exist and flow. Uh, it's very cold on Mars. Even at the equator, the temperature rarely exceeds the freezing point of water or ice, 32 degrees Fahrenheit, zero degrees centigrade. And usually um, it's around, you know, it's minus 100, 150 at the uh, equal, equatorial region, so quite, quite cold. And here's, of course, is a, a Hubble space photo picture. I'll give you some more detailed pictures uh, using a spacecraft that we have sent to Mars. Uh, and we have an extensive number of spacecraft on Mars. Let's look at the relative size. Mars's gravity is only about four-tenths of Earth's gravity. Our moon's gravity is one-sixth. So Mars is about half the radius of Earth, and here's the relative comparison. I told you that Mars's orbit varies more, uh, be, and what we do is we call the orbit, we have a new yardstick in our solar system where we say that it is one astronomical unit is the distance from the sun to uh, Earth, average 93 million miles, and it turns out that Mars's orbit, instead of being circular, varies from 1.4 to approximately 1.7 times the distance of Earth to the Sun. So that's quite a bit more uncircular than Earth's orbit. Let's talk about how you get to Mars with current rocket technology. And the way that we do that is we give the rocket a big boost leaving Earth we have to accelerate it to more than 25,000 miles per hour. And uh, we, then we shut the engines down and we basically coast to Mars. And here would be Earth at the position of a, a probe that is going to Mars. Here's Mars at the time of launch of that probe. And, and the lowest energy transfer is called a home, Hohmann orbit. This is the least amount of rocket energy from Earth to go to Mars is a half of an orbit launching here, arriving at Mars here. And of course, we have predicted that time being around eight and a half months, eight and two thirds months each way, it would take us to a probe that would arrive at Mars. Now. In order to get to Mars, we have to add about 11% to Earth's orbital velocity, which is right at 30 kilometers per second or around 66,000 miles an hour. So we have to add an extra 7,000 miles per hour to the space probe, and then it will begin this, it would leave Earth and then head toward Mars right here. Now, the, because of the motion of Earth taking one year to do this and Mars taking almost two years to do this, this geometry for the lowest energy launch to Mars only occurs every slightly more than two years. And that's why we now send probes to Mars on a little bit more than two-year intervals. Now, just to give you an example, to launch from here to here with this lowest energy transfer, if I tried to launch from here to Mars, would take more than twice as much energy, and that is a very, very big rocket. If you have the opportunity to watch the new movie, The Martian, I highly recommend it. It's a great book. I've seen the book all over the uh, ship, people reading the book Ma Martian by Andy Weir, and uh, it's really a great book. I, I get, I've gotten at least 50 emails that said, Frank, 
is this technically feasible, what they're talking about in this book, in the movie? And I'm here to tell you that most, almost everything in the book, in the movie, is technically feasible, is technically accurate. I'm very surprised that Hollywood made a movie that doesn't have, uh, you know, the majority of it being totally unrealistic. How many of you saw Gravity? Right? And it is totally unrealistic to believe that you could go from the Russian space station to the International Space Station and then the China, Chinese space station with a fire extinguisher. Trust me, that is not happening. They're in completely different orbits, and you're not going to do it. But this, this story of the Martian is quite accurate in terms of the Hermes probe flying by Earth, picking up a Chinese launch supply rocket and going to Mars and trying to reposition, and the transfer times are, uh, are pretty close. Uh, this is a busy chart. All I want to tell you about this chart is that going to Mars is very hard. Look at the number of launch failures that have occurred. It's uh, quite difficult. It's a big technical achievement to get there. And our first successful flyby of Mars was uh, Mariner 4 in 1964. 15 of 15 Russian missions have failed. Three of six failed during this time by uh, our first orbiter, 64, our um, flyby, our first orbiter in 71. Viking 1 and 2 were the first landers in 1976. That's 40 uh, years ago almost. And they were te spectacular successes. Landing on Mars is hard. Getting to Mars is hard and landing there. Uh, a great success in 1996, 20 years later, before the next lander was the Sojourner, a small spacecraft that could rove around. And we used giant uh, airbags to actually do the final part of the landing. We do have a spectacular orbiter going around Mars called the MRO, the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter. It's been in operation since 2006. It is taking spectacular photos. It's got a pretty big telescope. I'll show you a couple pictures. The Mars Curiosity uh, Science Lab landed in 2012. Um, and it is about the size of a Volkswagen. So it is a very, very capable, uh, very capable science laboratory. Here's kind of a map that shows the various areas on Mars where we have landed. Here's Viking 1, Viking 2. Notice how we are looking at different areas and we're trying to follow the water. Why would we follow the water if we're looking for life as we know it? because we think that it takes liquid water to have life. We don't believe that there are large Martians or walking around creatures or four-legged or two-legged animals on Mars, but there very likely could be bacteria or amoeba or things like that, and it would be remarkable to find it. One other thing I want you to notice, this would be the equator of Mars, about right here, and then this is the longitude. Everything in blue is low elevation, and we have clear evidence that this blue area at one time in Mars's past used to be an ocean. So this is old ocean bed. Where did the liquid water go? One other interesting feature is the Hellenus Basin also contained water, but it is exactly 180 degrees, meaning the opposite side of the planet from this huge asteroid that struck here. And what we believe happened was that asteroid struck so hard, it sent a shock wave through the center of the planet and caused these volcanoes the largest in our solar system and to lift that land up and these are ancient shield volcanoes it is no accident that they are directly opposite from this huge impact basin another important feature is called the Valley Marineris it is so large that you could put Los Angeles here and uh, New York City here also notice that this would be a drainage area to these ancient ocean beds from any type of water that used to live up in this area. 
And I just talked about this antipodal, meaning that this bulge, this high ground, and these volcanoes are certainly related to the impact of this huge asteroid apart from it. In, 19, in 2015, we took infrared telescope studies of deuterium, which is, a, which is hydrogen that has one neutron, and it has some unique characteristics that we can tell from that studying deuterium that Mars had a very large ocean in its northern hemisphere, and this blue area represents where we think liquid water used to exist. And we think it was as much as one mile deep, 5,000 feet or so, um, and as large as the Atlantic Ocean for several billion years after Mars was formed. <clears throat> we have recently discovered from our Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter that these blue areas are somehow outgassing hydrogen <coughs> that we know has come from water, and we believe that these are ice glaciers covered by uh, hundreds and hundreds of feet of Martian dust that will keep it from evaporating and protecting it and insulating it. So we know there's water at the poles, and we have recently re discovered that these, we believe, are significant glaciers underneath a lot of dust on Mars. So m water will be extremely important uh, if, we, as, if, if we ever colonize Mars. We can turn water into hydrogen and oxygen for rocket fuel. We can turn it into oxygen for breathing. And all we need is a little bit of electricity for you physics students. Remember when we put two little in a glass of water, if we took two little probes, an anode and a and the, plus and a minus, and we ran battery power or de current through it that you would get oxygen off of one probe, hydrogen off the other probe called electrolysis. Mars has two satellites, Phobos and Deimos. They're small, 22 kilometers wide, 13 kilometers. We, have, we think that these are probably captured asteroids from the asteroid belt rather than having formed around Mars like our moon. Notice they do have craters. Here's a big one. The other interesting thing is that uh, Phobos rises in the west and sets in the east, which is the opposite of our moon and our sun rising in the east and setting in the west. So every 11 hours, Phobos speeds across the sky in the wrong direction for we humans. Uh, Deimos rises in the east and slowly sets in the west every 2.7 days. And to give you a comparison, that's about one-tenth of the orbital period of our moon. Remember, our moon goes around the Earth about every 28 and a half days. Deimos is closer, much closer, and it orbits every 2.7 days. Mariner 4 in 1965 showed us the first pictures of Mars. I, this is the size of a rocket, an Atlas Agena, the largest rocket we had at the time, picture of the spacecraft in 1965. Well, all I can tell you is we come a long way, baby, in 50 years. Here is the first picture returned from Mars. Look how grainy it is. Very difficult to tell any details. I'm going to show you some pictures later and remind you what this one looks like to give you, a, uh, give you an idea of how far our technology has improved and our ability to send large data files and these digital photographs over those distances in our computers and our radio systems. Mariner 6 and 7 actually orbited with our next most powerful rocket, the Atlas Centaur. This is the rocket that I worked on, the upper stage in its computers after graduating from the University of Colorado for two years out at uh, San Diego at Kearney Mesa, and that's the plant where this rocket was developed. And of course, we did the trajectory design and the computers tell it where to go. But look at how our, we found rocky and cratered terrain 
in uh, uh, 1969, uh, about four years after the first flyby. If you're going to orbit Mars, it takes a lot more fuel than if you're just going to fly by because you have to kill that velocity at Mars but with a rocket engine and a propellant that you carry and now allow Mars's orbit to capture you and orbit it. Mariner 9 ret returned the first orbital images in 71. This is Olympus Mons, the largest shield volcano we have ever found in the solar system. It is 600 kilometers from here to here, and it is over 70,000 feet tall, and there's the miles, 14 miles tall, 370 miles wide. Uh, it is a huge, huge uh, volcano and I want to put it inside a country you might recognize to give you a sense of how large this volcano is. The other thing about shield volcanoes is the Hawaiian Islands are good examples of what we would call shield volcanoes. Iceland is another example of shield volcano, meaning it's sitting over some hot spot and the lava is building that land out of the sea, but Hawaiian islands wouldn't even would all fit inside this caldera of Olympus Mons on Mars, and there's no way that Iceland is anywhere this big, is it? Iceland may be about this big, so it's a huge, huge volcano. Viking 1 and 2 landed on Mars in 1976. Uh, the lander was named uh, Carl, Carl Sagan. Uh, memorial Station. It used the next, uh, we kept, kept making bigger rockets, so by 1976, the largest rocket we had, two solid rocket motors, Titan, Centaur upper stage right here. Here were pictures as uh, the Mariner, Viking 1 and 2 approached, and it shows the Valley Marineris which is huge, 3,000 miles from here to here, almost 5,000 kilometers. Here's a picture, the first pictures of surface of Mars returned from the Viking 1 and 2 landers. You thought the Grand Canyon was big. Here's L.A., here's New York City in that huge Valley Marineris. Uh, our Grand Canyon is about one mile deep. This one is four and a half miles deep, or seven kilometers. It is a huge, huge structure, the uh, very deep and long valley on Mars. In 1996, 20 years it took before we landed the next probe successfully on Mars. And uh, we, this is uh, one of our most reliable, the Delta II. Here's its landing site on Mars. It used an, a unique airbag system. Here's the spacecraft about this big. In, it is inside supported, so however this bouncing tetrahedron uh, lands, whatever position it is, when it finally stops, we will deflate the airbags, and then the lander and its system will be hanging down from Mars gravity, and then they can drive the sojourner off. Uh, for spacecraft this size, we can use these airbags, very effective. Because Mars' atmosphere is so thin, our parachutes don't work as well. So we use a parachute after we have aerodynamic entry to slow it down. We use a parachute as much as we can, but we cannot make a parachute big enough to soft land on the surface of Mars. The air is too thin. Here's the Sojourner. It was designed by JPL. Uh, this, this is the airbags after they've deployed the Carl Sagan Memorial Station right here, and this is the ramp that this sojourner to wander around went down uh, and, is, and, and uh, spent a lot of time looking for water and we found clear evidence of a much warmer and wetter period in Mars's past from soil and rock samples. Another opportunity was spirit and opportunity in Mars in 2003 they were landed by parachute, and then we had to assist it with a deceleration rocket. Here's actually the lander on the, uh, at the bottom, uh, and as these spacecraft are heavier, 
the landing systems have to become more sophisticated. Spirit and Opportunity landed at two different places. Notice they're quite a bit larger than the Sojourner. These are solar panels. We're still able to generate electricity from the sun on the surface of Mars. Very important. They recharge the batteries. This is a, a picture of Opportunity after it landed. Uh, and actually, Opportunity is still operating in a degraded sense. It can't move as fast. It has, it, it has you know, a flat tire or two, not two, which are made of metal, by the way. Uh, but we've, we have eroded them, degraded them. The bearings don't work as well, but it's still very, very capable. Stereos stereoscopic cameras, it could take pictures and allow us to figure out and send radio commands to Opportunity and Spirit that says, okay, you've told us what you see. Now drive over here, this number of meters, turn left 13 degrees and drive this many meters and go over here. And when you get to this rock, Please go drill in it. We also had a shovel on the front, little trench digger. And sure enough, this white stuff right here was water ice on Mars after we dug a trench in the dirt. And the reason we know it was ice was because we watched it for about 24 hours. And what happened to the ice? Remember I said it couldn't exist as a liquid? What happens to carbon dioxide on Earth, dry ice, when you put it out on a table? Does it turn into a liquid? No, it goes directly to a gas. It's called sublimation. And that's what happens on, with ice on Mars. It goes directly from solid. And so this white stuff just disappeared over 24 hours as the ice sublimated. 11 years after landing, this is opportunity, looks at the Cape Tribulation, and then it climbed to the top of this cape, and then looking back over this direction in 2014, it's now taken a, a picture from the top, and as you see on my arrow right here, that area represents the top of this mound, and Endeavor Crater, and Opportunity and Spirit were, were terrific successes in uh, 1996. We had an opportunity completed a marathon drive. It was 26 miles. What is it? 26.2 miles for a marathon run. Uh, if you do the Boston or any other place. And look at the track from where it landed. It went to Victoria Crater. We, we, have, we use the orbiter that's around Mars to go take pictures of things of interest, and we could also have its cameras are, are looking. We would find things of interest that we thought might indicate water, and then we went up to the top of Endeavor Crater, and Opportunity is right about here now, still doing, um, still doing uh, science for us, not driving as far. Now, how long do most of you take to run a marathon? Two to four hours, right? And at my age, maybe two or three days. Here's, it took 11 years and two months for opportunity to run this 26.2 miles, so it wasn't in a big hurry. Our Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, with our beautiful high-rise, meaning high-resolution camera, we sent to Mars in 2006. This is the camera. These are the different science instruments looking at the surface, helping us determine what are the materials, doing some spectroscopy, etc. Look at the size of the antenna that is sending this information back to Earth from these huge, huge distances. A significant, the largest communications antenna we've ever put on a spacecraft, and the reason is these are very high resolution digital photographs and with smaller antennas would take forever to send one photo. Here's at the Ball Aerospace uh, Facility in Boulder, Colorado near my alma mater is the high rise camera. It's sun shield to keep the sun from coming in and damage the optics. Um, how many of you are camera fans and have a telephoto lens? or you watch our American football games where the guys are down in the end zone, they've got a telephoto lens about this long and maybe that big around. 
this, look how big this telephoto lens is. This is a serious telephoto lens, and we sent it to Mars to get pictures like this. Colorful sediments near the Hellas Impact Basin. That was that big blue area that I showed you that's on the opposite side from the volcanoes. This is the edge of that impact basin. Look at the incredible detail from that earlier 1969 photo of a flyby. It's just amazing how much detail we can see. Flowing liquid water, we believe, carved these canyons. And this is dust and sand that the wind on Mars blows and makes these different sand dunes. But can you believe the, the different geological activity and the amount of detail that we can see from this orbiting camera that's been there for about nine years and still doing fabulous science as it takes pictures around Mars? These are gullies on the side of a crater like this that I do a close-up with MRO, and this white stuff is frost that has come out of these gullies because we think the water is actually underneath. Recently, you may have seen some uh, uh, media coverage that we now think that we have clear evidence that at certain times a year, we will see some water in the liquid form that has become warm enough to, to actually flow from through the sand down a gully like this and leave this dark stain like tears falling from your eyes. It doesn't last very long, day or so, and then it will turn into a gas again. We have actually taken these photographs, and uh, once the sun hits these valleys, it'll start to evaporate, and this ice, the frost that's up there, just like frost on Earth, will disappear after the sun comes up and warms it up. The, uh, the ladies, you're going to love this. What we see here, almost everything you see in the white and blue is solid opal. Solid opal. So let's go to Mars and make some jewelry. Don't you know we could destroy the opal jewelry market by bringing back some of this stuff? Absolutely beautiful detail. Wind-blown sand, sandbars. They're perched high up on the, the Tharsis Ridge near those three shield volcanoes. And uh, so the, M, the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter is giving us tremendous information. These look like the great sand dunes in the Sahara Desert. We also can see the pictures from orbit uh, this path is almost a third of a mile long where a big rock has been dislodged and tumbled down this hill and now sitting right here. Remember the early photographs that you could only see some fuzzy detail? This is amazing, the amount of detail that we can see with the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter. There we go. I told you I would remind you what we saw in 1965. Now we're looking at rocks rolling down hills from orbit about Mars. Curiosity rover was the next lander, and it, uh, we've, it flew in 2011. It landed in 2012. It's doing fabulous science. It's about the size of a small compact car, very heavy. This is our current largest rocket in the U.S. inventory, the Atlas V. Atlas V is also used to, to launch our large military communications and reconnaissance uh, spacecraft. It takes a rocket this big to send a compact car to Mars to go do science. Here's uh, uh, what Curiosity looks like, very sophisticated. It's trying to determine whether life ever arose on Mars, characterize its climate and geology, prepare for human exploration, find us water that we can use so humans can, perhaps we can send an early lander to Mars if we can tap into water and have it make the fuel on the surface of Mars to fuel a rocket that could return the human uh, explorers back into Mars's orbit and have a larger spacecraft that goes from Earth to Mars 
This is the same thing in this march and movie. It's the right concept that we should use, but we want to, instead of sending propellant to Mars, let's see if we can figure out how to manufacture propellant on Mars. We have cameras, spectrometers, radiation detectors, environmental sensors, atmospheric sensors. Very sophisticated. Look at its uh, uh, wheels. These are all metal. They're not filled with air, and they have independent suspension. This is actually a picture that uh, of, of Curiosity. Um, it's, it has detected large water deposits one meter underneath the crater that it is currently exploring called the, gray, the uh, Gale Crater. And here's some information on the detector that's looking from, for characteristic neutrons from this water. And uh, it's just below the surface. Um, the reason we have these huge antennas is here's a billion picture, pixel view of Curiosity on Mars at the rock nest and the big mountain in the background. Incredible detail in a billion picture, pixel picture. It sounds easy to say, billion pixel picture. You got to say that fast. Here's where Curiosity landed. It had a rocket system that slowed it down and actually then hovered like a helicopter with a rocket engine and then used a cable that it allowed it to descend softly to the moon and then release the cable. So we actually winched the spacecraft pretty quickly down to the surface to keep from damaging it. And our camera in orbit shows the driving path and the wheels of the rover track. And in fact, right here is the Curiosity rover itself that we have enough resolution with the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter in orbit about Mars to take this picture 192 miles above Curiosity in orbit. Why explore Mars? We we think that we can understand global climate change in our solar system better, better. Where did all the water go and why? What are the implications for life on Earth? Uh, we believe that Mars, early in its formation, had a significant magnetic field. It's much smaller than Earth. Remember the picture of the two? So over time, it appears that it's, li it's a liquid core that probably has iron in it is may not be liquid any longer and it stopped generating a magnetic field and what that, what happens when we don't have a magnetic field is the solar wind from the sun can blow on the surface of Mars the magnetic field doesn't deflect those that solar wind away and it actually is blowing its atmosphere away and now uh, liquid water doesn't exist anymore. We want to advance technology on Earth that can be applied on, in new, new products. Remember ye, uh, yesterday, exploration, curiosity, the challenge, the desire to understand. It's part of our fundamental human nature. It'll, it'll enable an economic growth and enhance national security. How about inspiring our youth? There are people right now that, that uh, I don't think it's Richard Bransom, it's somebody else. I don't think Richard's is crazy. But somebody else is saying, we'll sell you a one-way ticket to Mars. How many of you would sign up for a one-way ticket to Mars? I'm putting my hand down. How, do you, how would you like to spend eight months in a spacecraft with people that want to go one way to Mars without a way to return, and they don't have free wine? Think about that. Those people are nuts. Do you want to go? <laughs> do you want to go eight months one way to Mars? I don't think so. We need to learn to travel, live, and work in space. It is our next frontier, and uh, seriously, because it's there, we need to go there. So that's the end of uh, that lecture, and uh, I have a little extra time to uh, answer some questions for you. So fire away.